We as adults and parents and kids' lives are the great party poopers of our life. Just think about a typical day. How much are you connecting and how much are you correcting or redirecting what they do? So I want to just quickly nip now um, because I want time for questions. So I'm cutting, I'm cutting out some of my, uh, uh, some of my stuff. I want to, I want to now talk about why do we really need to pay attention to this? And here's some of the research, um, uh, that we, um, uh, uh, that's been collected. So CAMH does a big, uh, Ontario student dr drug use and health survey. And what they are finding in the latest one in 2016, that a third, more than a third of our children are describing moderate to serious psychological distress. Now, one of the things that worries me about these numbers is these, the, the uh, survey is completed by young people whose parents have given them permission. It's still an act of consent process. So there's a huge number of kids who have not answered this survey. So I think, I guess, 34%, a third of our kids is a low estimate. We know from other research that the number of kids arriving at the emergency room with intense anxiety as well as self-harming behavior has gone through the roof in the past couple of years. So my colleagues and friends, and there's, there, there are other statistics there, my colleagues and friends at the Offord Centre have been involved in the school mental health survey. And so it's a great, really great survey. It really wants to look and deepen our understanding of the association between school and classroom environments and student mental health. So they're getting into the really nitty gritty and they want to disentangle the effect of poverty, school and family environments and other things. So they have looked at uh, thousands and thousands of kids, anonymous surveys that they've done, uh, teachers, students, students, as well as principals. So some of the highlights of it are that they find that kids are reporting, 11% of the children are reporting that they need professional help. 29% report that they experience significant psychological distress. 11% say, I need help, and guess what? They're not getting it. But part of it is they're not turning to others for help. And that worries me just as much. It worries me just as much that they don't see the adults in their lives as being able to support them through this. We need to shift that. And that's the work that my friend Kathy Short in School Mental Health is doing so profoundly. But, you know, when you look at... What can we do about emotional and behavioral difficulties? Look at these slides. So what these slides, along the bottom is relationship quality, asking the kids, asking the principals about relationship quality. And when you have high, you see those, the, the green bar there, when you have high school quality of relationships, the emotional difficulties go down. And when you look at the school level, what the uh, administrators report is even higher when you look at the kids. When you look at... Uh, behavioral difficulties, so the externalizing. What you see is a similar thing. School relationship makes a difference. We need to be focusing on well-being. We need to be focusing on the relationships that kids have. This one, I think, is so powerful. It shows that when you are poor, you're, you're in a lower SES, so that's that top line. You have more uh, behavioral difficulties in a low school climate of quality of relationships. But look at that. If you are in a school where there are high quality of relationships, man oh man, you have fewer externalizing behaviors than the well-to-do kids have in poor quality. Do you see that? This is profound. So to finish, relationships matter. Relationships matter. And so what does it look like? How can you help give, promote the sense of well-being? Well, it's about having meaningful relationships, knowing your students, 
genuine connection, know what they are interested in. Systemic, explicit and intentional, welcoming, including, understanding, promoting and partnering. This is from, you can Google and find this, School Mental Health Assist, Mentally Healthy Classrooms. Fantastic resources. It's all about relationships, relationships, relationships. And then, you know, what is it that kids need to do well? What they need to do well is have a warm welcome, a smile, a chance to learn, a safe place to risk, and a connection to a caring adult every single day. You know, the Cherokee tell the tale of all, we have two wolves in us. One is loving and kind and generous, and one is angry and mean and shallow. And one of the children in front of the grandfather says, which one wins? He says, it depends which one you feed. We are in an Ontario that has a very different intentionality about what we are feeding, not only our students, but our teachers and our administrators. So it's our task through People for Education and our other voices to support and make sure that the feeding continues to be the healthiest it can be. So I'm going to stop there and say thank you very much for your great attention here this morning. Thank you very much. So we've got time for a few questions. We have a question up because this one's not working for some reason. No, now it's working. Okay. There it is. Yes, there is a mic over here. People can come to the mic, and we've only got about 10 minutes for questions. What we may do is get our panelists, if you can start heading up to the stage yes. so that you're ready to go. Jean said she wouldn't mind if I you sit on mind. the stage with her. So go ahead, Jim. Thank you, Dr. Jean. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Talk a little bit more about the made, not born, and be genetically predisposed to sort of learning and the nature-nurture thing that we all learned about back in second year. Yes. Like, and why can some children do those math equations and others just, no way, they can't get it. Why does that happen? Why is that? Okay, so people are made, not born, is actually talking exactly what you're talking about. And that is that we now know that our genes are not our destiny, but that the genes get turned on or silenced by the interaction and experience literally sculpts and builds the brain. So one of the math myths that we have in terms of that is if it's hard to do, you're not very good in math. And that's just a myth. Many of the great mathematicians are very slow thinkers and slow processors. So we would never give up on somebody learning how to read and saying they just don't have a reading brain. But we do have this mental model of you can say that with math. So what we need to be thinking about is the growth mindset around math. Not that people can't do math, but that there are different ways that they have to learn it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Bonjour. Bonjour. I really don't know how to start, but if you allow me, doctor, to share my recent experience as a new teacher. It was a Friday after school, and by leaving, I see that nine-year-old child by the wall, and like I can see his face looking so miserable and sad. And I approach him like, hmm, someone is not happy today. He knocked. He is one of the children that most of the teachers don't like to have him in their class. So I didn't really know what happened, but I'm like, you want to talk about it? And I see his eyes turning red. I'm like, give me a hug. And he hugged me and he started crying. Hey. Nine-year-old boy doing this, it means that he's suffering. I'm like, I can go home on a Friday afternoon and leave that child this way. So I went to my, to my office, tried to find something that, you know, he, he might like. And then I found a pen. I went back to him. They couldn't find him in the room. He was lying down on a carpet, his head down and crying. And you know why? Because he was misbehaving in the other class, so they put him, they punished him and put him in another school with the little one. All I could do is like, okay, I have this pen for you. 
And I tried, you know, talking about the pen just to distract him. He took the pen, he raised his hand, uh, his head, and he said, Merci. Mm. Now he loves to see me. Yes. So I'm not trying to impress anyone, but yes, back to you, doctor, is we might, we, we might need as a teacher and education to, to think about them as our kids, our own kids, and Absolutely. treat them as human beings. Yes. Wow, well, what a wonderful students. story. Thank you. You know, I think a couple of points. I think what you've illustrated is that the humanness that you bring to that interaction is what helped that little one. Now, nobody is asking you to be his therapist, to be his clinician. If you, if you hear about trauma and other things, you go to your social worker or your support in school. But you had such a wonderful, you made a difference. You built his brain in a different way of possibility and hope. Thank you. Yes, please. I'm wondering if you have any comments about the effect of class sizes and the size of schools, like the number of students in schools, and how that affects the ability to build those connections. Right. So uh, that's a nice political question to ask <laughs> as I stand up here, as I stand up here. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's all kinds of research. There's all kinds of research on what good sizes of classrooms are. I have to say and have publicly said before, I'm very concerned about the kindergarten, 30 kids in a class with two teachers. It's not the same as 1 into 15. It's not the same as having 2 to 15 and it being 30, because it's big, and, and, and I, think that is being, I think that's being addressed. I think, though, at the heart of the matter is the quality of support that teachers get and the quality of the learning environment that the teachers create. There are classes with 12 kids in them that are horrific, and there are classes with 20 26 kids in them who are you die to have your children there so it has a lot a lot to do with the, the learning environment and I think that's what we need to be focusing on the supporting of the teachers around that learning environment thanks Thank for you. the question and now I'm in trouble but I got to say it again 30 is too many yes <laughs> um, and this will be the last question the last question okay yes okay this regards the, uh, the CAMH study on uh, what did you say psych uh, student mental health the psychological distress that they experience? Yes. You said that 11% uh, say they need help, 29% said that they express psychological distress. Yes. Can you distinguish between social, pardon me, what was the cause, social or academic distress? Yeah, so it's a very good question. Uh, in the surveys, they're not asking. Uh, they didn't ask particularly, that, as I'm aware of, the survey questions to see. It probably is a compilation of both because we do know that kids are f finding social, you know, this stuff, are finding it very, very stressful. But in other places where they have looked at academic stress, they find that it's very, very common across the world and rising. Yeah. So I would ask you, if you had a choice to employ an empathic specialist teacher versus an empathic generalist, who would you hire? All depends on who they were. The characteristics of the people you've got, you've got, there's a subtext to that question, I suspect. Yes. Ah. Well, I'm yes. not a child psychiatrist for nothing, eh? <laughs> and, and what I was going to say was, I, I, I'm a retired teacher and I taught mainly in middle school. And I felt that uh, if specialist teachers began being employed at grade seven, so that the intermediate division curriculum is handled by a specialist because I'll tell you, the, what was so dynamic about middle school is the anxiousness of the student to assume responsibility. Yes, like, absolutely. It's incredible. When their brains incredible. are under construction, there's not time and, yet. And that is why I truly think that the middle school concept might be outdated mm -hmm. and at the junior high school model where I go to you the math specialist go to her as the English specialist etc yes yeah. would groom students better than generalists mm -hmm. yes okay thank you for sharing that all right thank you very much we're moving on to our panel we right are on and once more can we all have a big round of applause for Jane she is so wonderful thank you so much you're so welcome thank you thank you